Okay, you're good to go. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks to everyone who made it out in person. Um, and for those who are watching online, you can also ask questions via the chat, um, and we'll be able to pull those up and talk to them. But my name is Jacob Sikora. I'm one of the spine surgeons here at St. Mark's. I work out of the Salt Lake Orthopedic Clinic here in the North Medical Building. I was asked to give a talk on neck and back pain, kind of the causes and, and treatment options for it. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to chime in at any time and we can evaluate and talk about that further. But essentially the talk today is about neck and back pain, why it happens and how it can be treated. Just a little something about myself, some background information. I was born in Austria. A lot of my family's in Poland. So I grew up going back there a lot with my grandparents and I uh, grew up in Michigan and, and had did medical school and training in, in San Diego and then Texas for fellowship for spine surgery. So I've, uh, I've traveled a lot. I've met a lot of really awesome people, and I've learned a lot from all the different ways of life. So I understand that people's expectations of, of what they want to do in their free time differ from someone who's a surfer in San Diego to someone who's working the auto factory in, in Michigan to my grandparents in Poland. Uh, much of their expectations are, are drastically different, whether you're a Navy SEAL or you're a professional athlete or you're a gardener. So whenever we talk about spine issues, we talk about the three W's of spine care, where, what type, and what to do. These are the most important questions because essentially you want to come with an accurate diagnosis. The diagnosis is the key to everything in spine surgery. There are a lot of great options, but the right surgery for the wrong person is not going to equal a great outcome. So the most important thing is trying to marry the two things, the, the problem, the diagnoses, and the treatment options. So you're unable to treat if you don't know what the problem is. And the spine's complex. It takes years of, of education, but more importantly, if you realize that it's made of 33 different vertebrae, and more importantly, 364 tiny joints make up your back. It's not like the knee or hip that are four joints total. It's not like you point to something and say, oh, your knees, you got a bad knee, you got a bad hip. Here it could be, you could have a bad L1, L2, L3, or certain joints or certain discs or certain nerves at all those segments. So again, the diagnosis is the most important thing. The first W is the where. Where do you hurt? And here you can see the 33 vertebral bodies with those small shock absorbers in between each bone. And in the back of each bone, you have the joints. They're called the facet joints, but that's the fulcrum that your body moves on. Housing and inside all of that are nerves. All these nerves control everything to the way your fingers and feet move to how you feel things on your thigh or on your back or, or even radiating across your abdomen. Part of your vertebral bodies here on the top right corner that you can see there, this is looking at it as if you were looking down the tube. The top part is the bony aspect and that open triangle, the white stuff, is where you have the nerves. And I'll just point, point to it here. Sorry for all those watching at home, but that's where the nerves are. And that's often the most common issue is that something's going on with those nerves, whether it's in the middle of the bony housing or outside as they leave. And there are different regions of the spine. There's the cervical spine, which has been commonly known as the neck. There's the thoracic spine, which, is, uh, which houses the rib cage. And then there's the low back, the lumbar spine, that also sits on top of the pelvis. So with that, the, the vertebral and the bone and the nerves, they're all shaped differently based on these sections. And the treatment is way different, even if it's the same problem. A herniated disc in the neck is treated differently than a herniated disc in the low back. So... The spinal cord runs from the top of your neck all the way down to about L1, so about the top of the lumbar spine, and then it comes down for roots. So that affects the treatment because you can't just move the spinal cord as easily as you can the, the nerve roots. So we'll get into that in a, in a little bit too, but going furthermore on the where, people can have pain from the vertebrae. People can have pain here. This is called a compression fracture. So if you notice the vertebrae, this is of the lumbar spine, meaning the low part of your back. The vertebrae are, are shaped like Legos. They're nice square shapes. 
And there's five of them. And here, if you count from the bottom, the fifth one, or L1, you can see it looks like a slice of pizza. That at one point was a Lego, but because of the fracture, it collapsed into a pizza slice. And I've seen this in as young as in the teens from a snow, uh, like a sledding accident in the Cottonwood Canyons to someone with osteoporotic bone and, and even car accidents. And sometimes you'll see it if someone's wearing a seatbelt, the seatbelt stops it, but the force of a high speed collision can cause something like this. So a lot of times if someone's presenting with this type of pain, it's a lot of pain right here in the middle, not a lot of radiating pain, but their spine or their column is essentially unstable. Um, you know, it's funny going back to the where is asking people when they're in pain to point out where their back pain is. Cause I've seen people who say, Oh, my back hurts. And I ask them to point to it and they point out here to their ribs, but in their head, it's their back. It's like, Oh, what happened? And I fell down a ladder. Well, you, you broke some ribs. So, but that, that's part of the most important thing is the diagnostic part of being able to talk to people and ask where, where, where. You can also develop pain from the discs, which are those shock absorbers in between the bone. So you have the bony elements, which we just went over, but in between them, you have a shock absorber. That helps us move, helps us rotate, helps us turn. And with that, when that herniates or essentially busts out, that can cause a terrible amount of pain. Here in this picture, you see that where you have those Legos lined up on one another, those are beautiful discs. And then where that blue arrow points to, that's called the disc herniation. Essentially, part of that disc squirt out and is now pinching a nerve, which is why people with a disc herniation can have radiating nerve pain. And based on where that is, the, the, the presentation of someone in that can be way different. If you herniate a, a disc in your, uh, around your spinal cord, people can feel unbalanced or they feel like their legs or arms are disconnected from their body versus if it's low down in their back, you may lose like bowel bladder control or you may have a foot drop or weakness in a specific part of your leg. So all that's very important. And again, like I mentioned earlier, those joints, you have so many joints, over 200 joints in your spine. That all adds up and any single one of those joints can become arthritic or worn down. And every time they move, they scream for help. And that would be caused facet joint pain or arthritic pain. So every time you bend forward or bend sideways, sometimes just a joint pain can cause tremendous amount of discomfort. But again, going back to that where. And then you can have nerve pain. When a nerve is affected, these diagrams are showing where all these different nerves go to. So if someone with a C6 nerve pain, they can have horrible shooting pain into their thumb and index finger. You can have horrible shooting pain into your little toe or big toe if it's your L5 or S1 nerve. So we're able to actually cheat a little bit when I hear someone that has pain kind of on the outside that doesn't go past the knee. I'm thinking L3 nerve. But, but based on the symptoms and based on what they're feeling, you can often kind of work backwards and kind of say, hey, this is the cause of your pain. Because oftentimes on an MRI or an x-ray, you can have a million things that are essentially the radiologist has read as this is a problem, this is a problem. When in reality, it's often just one level or one issue. So you've always got to worry about, from my end, about false positives. So helping kind of triangulating these symptoms, it helps a lot, putting it, at least creating a diagram in your head of where the pain's actually coming from. And last but not least, people can have pain in their SI joints. So oftentimes, 8 to 15% of low back pain isn't even in the low back. It's part of your pelvis. Typically, it's women after menopause. The same hormones that cause the pelvis to open up and help during childbirth and all that and loosen up the pelvis to create a canal for the baby. After menopause, or sometimes those loose ligaments can develop arthritis, and oftentimes, that manifests as pain at the bottom of the low back, but it's coming from the SI joint. So again, going back to helping diagnose where is it hurting is the most important thing. And sometimes this is missed and it's inadequately treated for the low back. The second W is what type? There are lots of different types of pain, electrical pain, spasm, annoying numbness, grinding, cramping, positional. So oftentimes when people say, ah, oh, my back spasms, typically that's not even coming from the, the bone or the nerve. That's part of your muscle. 
sometimes you've overloaded a muscle or done something where it causes your, your muscles to spasm. So if you imagine, if you were to touch a hot stove, your reaction, your reflex is to pull back. Your muscles on your back can't pull back. They're attached. So what they do is essentially reflexively spasm. And that can come as back pain. And, and oftentimes, and I've dealt with many of these issues myself, and they suck. But a lot of these are transient, and they pass and they get better. Sometimes I hear of electrical pain. People will say, oh my gosh, I have this electrical zinger going up and down my back or up and down my leg. That's typically classical for nerve pain, meaning a nerve is being pinched somewhere. So this is just an example of a, a bone spur, just like how people get it in their elbows, their wrists. Bone spurs on nerves is probably the worst type of bone spur because it's in the exact worst place, meaning if you had a bone spur on your elbow, typically it's not going to cause radiating shooting pain. But if you have a bone spur coming off one of those joints in your back, it only takes a few millimeters and boom, you get zingers going down your leg or zingers going down your arm. So sometimes nerve compression can present itself as annoying numbness. I mean, I've had patients with, with bad necks that say they have to wake up every few hours and shake their hands off because they have this annoying numbness and it wakes them up. So it's not pain per se but it is this highly irritating problem. Sometimes people say they have horrible grinding pain. And when you think of grinding pain, I think of instability. This is an x-ray of someone bending all the way back and bending forward. Here you can see the instability. It's pretty subtle, but you can see it. If you, if you imagine you draw these lines in the back of the vertebral bodies or of those Legos, here you can see how when they extend, it shifts back and when they move forward, it shifts and reposition itself equal. Well, when you got a nerve in between there and it's every time you move it, it's just banging and banging and grinding. That can be very uncomfortable as you imagine. And also cramping pain. People can have horrible cramping pain or foot pain or, or thigh pain. And oftentimes that's from a pinched nerve, you know, barring anything else going on, but typically that can be from a, a bone spur or, or some sort of disc herniation where they say, hey, it's not an electrical pain. It's not a numbness, but I get horrible cramps. And that's because the signal going from the brain to the muscles affected. And then there's going back to that positional pain where I'm relieved when um, I'm at a grocery store and I'm bent over on a shopping cart. That really helps. Because what that does is that opens up the spinal canal and can decompress your nerves. Or they say, when I bend back while I'm skiing, I have terrible pain. And that can be due to different things, whether it be a, a disc or a bad disc or a shock absorber, like we talked about earlier between the bone. Sometimes that degenerative disc, meaning it's just a bad, faulty disc, that movement on it can cause a terrible amount of pain. Or sometimes with that bony fracture where we said that Lego turns into a pizza slice, I mean, standing or bending on that pizza slice can cause a terrible amount of pain. So the last of the W's is what to do. And this is where people, again, if you don't have the right diagnosis and you don't have the right problem to address, then you're not going to be able to treat it right. So the, you have to have the, the first two parts right to be able to do this what to do part right. And I have a small brain, so I always try to keep it simple, stupid, the KISS method. So meaning try to use common sense. If something hurts somewhere, and the MRI says it's something else, well, don't necessarily believe that. Because especially if you get over the age of 40, this was an old study done, people over the age of 40 with zero symptoms, over 40% of them have either disc herniation, nerves that are pinched, and all this stuff. And it's like, whoa, whoa, hey, I don't have any symptoms. And then once you get over the age of 60, that number balloons up to 70%. So that's why you have to be careful when reading MRIs. You really have to correlate it with both the person and the MRI and the symptoms, because if the puzzle pieces aren't matching, then it doesn't make sense. And whatever you're gonna do for treatment isn't gonna work. So what it all comes down to really, from my perspective as a, as a spine treater, whether it's operative in the OR or non-operative treatment, you have to figure out what's hurting. And it's pretty mechanical. Is something moving that shouldn't be? And is something pinched or something compressed where it shouldn't be? And that's what it all comes down to. Um, my old boss used to say, we only do three things. We decompress, we stabilize, and sometimes we decompress and stabilize. 
but that's all you're doing as a spine um, surgeon. So going back to that earlier scene of, of pain and trying to figure it out, if it's inflammation or those muscle spasms, a lot of anti-inflammatories work great. Voltaren is one of my best friends that I personally use, and I highly recommend to other people. It's essentially a leave in a gel form. Sometimes that can help with inflammation, whether it's on the bones, muscles, or nerves. Sometimes systemic Tylenol or Advil or Motrin can help. And everyone's different. Some people love Motrin and hate Tylenol. Some people love Tylenol and hate Motrin. It's kind of finding out what works for you. But oftentimes when it's that bone pain, anti-inflammatories and pain meds help. For muscles, everything from strengthening these muscles, which I have the, the, the Pilates up here, which works great because it's, Pilates is different than yoga. Yoga requires you a lot of bending, whereas Pilates is a lot of extension-based exercises, whether it's planking on the floor. And the best part is a lot of it's free because it's on YouTube. And a lot of strengthening of the muscles really helps. Some people need some muscle relaxants. Like here's a common one, Flexeril, but there's many different. And same thing like anti-inflammatories. If one doesn't work, oftentimes another one will. It's just figuring it out. And again, the anti-inflammatories in Volterra. And the only thing that I would really add for nerve inflammation is there's certain drugs called neuromodulators that kind of change the signal or how, how your body sends it. And it's gabapentin and Lyrica. Some people find that extremely helpful, and some people hate it because it makes them nauseous or tired. And again, everyone's a little different. And last but not least, other things that work that are non-operative are epidural steroid injections. This is a different type of injections that you hear versus an epidural when um, someone's pregnant and about to deliver a baby. All this is is essentially laying down a lot of steroid um, in a liquid form and numbing medicine directly on the nerve that hurts. And steroid injections are great, both from a diagnostic perspective, meaning it can confirm that, aha, that's actually where the pain's coming from, versus a treatment perspective. People can get relief up to a few months to even a year with an epidural steroid. And everyone's a little different of how they react. And it depends on how big their issue is. So going back to what to do. So, and I'll have examples of these in the, in the upcoming slide, but for nerve compression, you have to figure out how can I decompress it. Sometimes, and, and most commonly, it's, it's called the decompression or a laminectomy. And here, this is a surgical procedure where you have the um, example of the spinal column here on your right, where all you're essentially doing is burying away that bone that's pinching the nerve. This is oftentimes a 45 minute or an hour long procedure that essentially you're freeing up where it's tight. You never want your nerves on an MRI to look like they're part of an hourglass where it gets really tight around the nerve and opens back up. But if it does and injections and all that stuff didn't provide the relief, then oftentimes a simple decompression is what's, what's uh, indicated. Sometimes, and here we have a picture of a microdiscectomy. It's a busy slide with a lot going on, but if you have a herniated disc or a bulging disc that's pinching on nerves, you cut out that piece of disc that's pushing on the nerve. So on the bottom left is an MRI of what a herniated disc looks like. So on the bottom third of that photo, you can see a black shock absorber that's essentially punching out towards that empty tunnel where the nerves are. That's a disc herniation. So what you do in that surgery, and it's one of the most common surgeries in all of orthopedics, is called a microdiscectomy where over a one to three inch incision, you essentially push the nerves over to the side, you burr out some bone, and you pluck out that disc that's already said, hey, I'm trying to pop out. That's the part that you carve out. And if you look at this middle diagram, that's what it's showing. It's showing those yellow nerves being pushed to the side and a piece of that disc coming out. And on that far right side, this is part of a massive disc herniation that I took out and it looks like an alien. And there's a little ruler, it's a couple centimeters big, but that's what a herniated disc actually looks like. And I personally, I take photos of all of them and I like to share them with patients because everyone always wants to know, what does it look like? What does it look like? And, and this is what it looks like. And it feels like a, um, almost like a, a eraser on a wooden pencil. Because that's not how it should be. It should be like the soft gelatinous material because it's a shock absorber but it herniated or ruptured because it's already proven 
it sucks for lack of better words. So this is what it looks like in real life. And sometimes for nerve decompressions, like in the neck, you can't do a microdiscectomy because of the spinal cord. So it's not like you can move the spinal cord because that's how you risk paralysis. So oftentimes you can treat it with a, what's called the disc replacement where you go in from the front of the neck, you carve out all that disc, and then you put in essentially this x-ray on the right, it looks like a tic-tac. And that's a picture of holding said disc replacement. So that's what they actually look like. They're actually pretty small, but the area that you're working is very small and often under a microscope. So on this MRI, you can see this is what a disc herniation looks like because this is the spinal cord and it's, it's essentially coming out and doing its best impression of Mike Tyson on there. And, and conversely, also a fusion's a good surgery if you have multiple levels. And this is a, a really bad MRI where you can see the spinal cord in the middle. And here you have multiple levels of that um, disc and arthritis that's essentially pushing on the spinal cord. People like this often present saying, my hands, I can't button up my jacket. I can't zip up my coat. I can't zip up my pants. I can't feel really my legs. I fall often because my legs feel disconnected from my body. And that's because the signal isn't getting from the brain to the legs. So that's treated with a multi-level, essentially decompressing decompression of the spinal cord also through the front of the neck. And that's what the surgery looks like here on the right, where you have these tiny little spacers in between the bone. And that's because you've carved out and realigned the neck and put on a plate. But that's what a fusion is. Here, you wouldn't want to do a disc replacement because there's so much arthritis and giving it motion would actually cause a lot of pain because there's so much arthritis. You don't want to give a painful arthritic joint more motion. Great question. So the question for everyone at home was, when you see arthritis, what is arthritis look like? Arthritis is just a fancy word for um, bone spurs and joint deterioration. So typically, whether it's your knee or your hip or every little joint in your spine, it's where two bones come together and it's beautiful, pristine cartilage and fluid and it can slip and slide on one another very well. And that's how our body's made to function and made to move. But over time, sometimes it can be sped up with trauma, like uh, who knows, some sort of bad fracture or injury. But over time, that smooth marble-like surface wears out. And then what happens is your body is now bone on bone because there's no cartilage. So now you have these two bones that aren't wanting to rub. It doesn't have that little cushion anymore in between. So essentially it rubs and rubs and rubs. Well, your body being as ingenious as it is, its response is, hey, I'm going to actually build more bone to protect myself, which is all fine if it's, again, in the foot, in the hip, in the ankle, because what it does is it's laying down more bone. The problem is if you lay down more bone in already a tight area, like the neck or the back, what happens is, is that bone that doesn't matter if it's in the elbow sticking out or you have a bone spur in your collarbone or bone spur in your shoulder, but if you have a bone spur that's banging up against a nerve, that, that's essentially what it looks like. It's, it's added bone in this deformed area that tightens the canal. So on this image here on the left, if you notice that, that snake-looking figure in the middle that's black, that's the spinal cord. And it's being essentially attacked by a lumpy, bumpy tube. So compare it to that one on the left from this previous, you can see that it's a much smoother and it has that white signal around it or fluid versus there, it's a lot tighter there. So that's what arthritis is. It's that bone spur, it's the laying down of additional bone, which depending on where it is can cause no symptoms like in the arm or wrist or something, or it can cause terrible symptoms if it's in the neck or over a nerve or something that's sensitive. Does that make sense? So, it's, it's your body's way of trying to protect itself, but sometimes, my old boss used to say, um, you, you, you got in the way by helping, meaning you, you tried to help, and in, in fact, it made things more difficult. And oftentimes, what we see is some instability in the spine. So as you can see here, going back to the Lego kind of um, uh, example, 
you typically want to see your Legos all lined up. But unfortunately, sometimes whether it's arthritis or, or worn out joints, um, you can see one of the Legos skips forward on the Lego below it. So if you notice here on this image on the left, on one of those squares at the bottom, do you see how it's about halfway sliding across one of the bones that it's supposed to be sitting on and lined up? It's right here ne near the word extension. So you have this bone that slid forward on that bone. That's because the joints in the back or the bone in the back is incompetent and sometimes can be broken. So think about it like reins on a horse. Someone clipped the reins on a horse and the horse jumped forward. That's what can happen there. And that can lead to horrible nerve issues because that canal, instead of it being wide open, is now like the Olympic rings where you see that Venn diagram and it decreases in size by 50%, 75%, 90%. So that can be treated again with what we talked about earlier, fusion, where we essentially put in a spacer block here and reline everything up and stabilize it with screws. So again, I know everyone and a lot of people think of the word fusion as a, as a negative thing, but for the right patient, it can be life-changing and it can be great. But if it's used for the wrong problem or if it's the wrong treatment for the wrong problem, uh, things cannot end up so well. So that's why it's so important to really make sure you have the diagnosis hammered down. But here you can see, this is what it looks like when a spine is, is, is came, came and saw me when it wasn't lined up to then what it looks like very well lined up. So it created all the, the room for the nerves in the legs. And even, I know I mentioned fusion, but there's so many different types of fusions. There's fusions that go in straight from the back where you essentially burr down some bone and put in a spacer or bone graft. There's some that you go in from the side and then from the back. And, and we're lucky here at St. Mark's, we're able to do the one of the best types, which is from the front. It's called an anterior lumbar inner body fusion, where you essentially make an incision through the abdomen. And with the help of our vascular surgeon friends, we move over the really important stuff and we're able to get a really good alignment and fusion rate through that, but not many places even in the state really do that. But there's so many different types of fusion that not all are the same. Some, like on the far left one, you just go in from the front and you put in the block and you don't have to put in screws from the back. And sometimes you have to do both, go in from the front or back. But again, it's figuring out what the problem is. Is it instability? Is it a bad disc? And going back to the anterior lumbar, which is what we focus on here, Here's a picture of Tiger Woods because that's what he had a year before he won the Masters. So he had a fusion, an anterior lumbar fusion done, and then a year later won the Masters. I'm not saying that you're all of a sudden going to become a good golfer, but I'm saying the right surgery for the right person can lead to some extraordinary results. And here at St. Mark's, another thing that we have is some robot-assisted or guidance navigational where we have, we're very lucky here, and again, not many hospitals do, where you have intraoperative help where you can use a CT scanner and you can pre-plan your screws, and that leads to better outcomes, less infections, and, quote, more minimally invasive surgery. So going back to this example of the painful and degenerated disc, sometimes, and depending on the arthritis and how much motion you want to preserve, you can do a standalone fusion from the front, which is all through the belly, which confuses a lot of people when they come to see me and they're saying, no, I have back problems and we're talking about abdomen surgery, but after explaining it, but this is why, because you can get better access to the column from the front. And then there's also a lumbar disc replacement, which is for the right person, a, a young and healthy without arthritis person, you can retain some of that motion by doing it, but, but that indication is pretty narrow. And there again, are, uh, like I mentioned, the epidural injection, but for the joint pain that we talked about, that really painful motion that you have at a joint, some procedures called the radiofrequency ablation can be done where you essentially put a needle down at that joint and burn the nerves that go to that joint. So you're essentially disconnecting it from the brain, the pain sensors. And some people find this extremely helpful. So these are just a few examples of patient experiences as we wrap up here, but this is to put it all together from everything that we talked about, but this was a 66-year-old female with horrible shooting leg pain and cramping. And what that yellow arrow is pointing to 
and a, a slice when you rotate it to look down the tube was a big massive cyst that was expanding in the spinal co column that was pushing on nerves. So the sac of fluid was causing a horrible amount of compression. So this is treated by making about a two inch incision and you burr out the bone and you take out that cyst. And as you can see on that image on the left, that's a very big cyst pushing on things that has no business doing or pushing on. This was that disc herniation from earlier. This was actually a 31 year old who, who came on Memorial Day weekend, was having a friend, fun at a pool party, had a massive disc herniation, lost control of all bowel and bladder. If that happens, that's a surgical emergency and should get taken care of within 24 hours. We took care of it almost within two hours of her walking in the door of the emergency room. But that's what the disc herniation looked like. That was the offender. Everything, all of her symptoms resolved, but um, that's essentially what a, the worst case scenario of a disc herniation can look like. And this is a, an example of more of what we talked about earlier, that instability, as you can see those Lego blocks that are not lined up correctly where one is jumped or skipped in front of another on that X-ray on the left. It was treated with a fusion through the belly and through the back to realign and, and six weeks later was hiking the Tetons and walking through Yellowstone. Um, and this was a 33 year old who saw me who was limping, walking with a cane and you don't see many 33 year olds walking with canes. So, you know, it's a bad problem. And this was a uh, 31 year old rodeo cowboy from down south. This was someone who had a disc herniation in their neck that uh, severely impacted the way they could move their shoulder and their bicep. They couldn't lift up rope. They couldn't uh, wrangle anything. Uh, underwent a cervical neck disc replacement and was back doing what they love about three weeks later. So probably earlier, but they didn't tell me that. Um, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, this had been going on, this had been going on for about a year, this cyst, and this 33 year old male who was walking with a cane, this was going on for years, years, because again, some people, and myself included, don't like to go see doctors because, well, you, you don't like or that uncertainty of what's going to come next let alone of what you've heard of some sort of spine surgery, people are afraid, myself included. It's, and it's a totally reasonable and reasonable reaction. And people put these things off for years and say, oh, I'm going to deal with it. Oh, well. But, but many of these issues, and it just so happens, I mean, this was going on for almost a decade, this 27-year-old firefighter with debilitating back pain that we treated with a lumbar disc replacement. Um, so not necessarily. But, but yeah, so many things kind of add up and snowball years after years, and whether it's a, a taken care of earlier or later, the goals of surgery are the same, and that's ultimately to decompress whatever's being pinched or to stop that painful motion. Absolutely. And so I'm just one piece of the puzzle. I'm just the spine surgeon. I'm, I'm typically the one that, that goes in for surgery when everything else has failed. Meaning um, I use the resources. Most of the patients that see me get injections of some sort first to A, to confirm what they have going on. Meaning I think this nerve is pinched or I think this joint is um, irritated. They get treated with a steroid or numbing medicine in that area first to see to confirm, in fact, if that's what's going on. And for that, I use the resources of the community. There's many pain injection specialists around. Um, there's many, and, and that's typically, and there's uh, certain physical medicine rehab physicians where if it's a muscle issue and it's a weakness, work out and work with the therapist and get stronger before, because most of the people that come see me aren't operative, meaning many things that we then figure out and refer are treated with X, Y, Z, and not surgery. So yeah, I mean, to, to what you're saying, and all these things that we do, whether they're injections or something called an EMG, where sometimes 
you undergo a nerve test where you stick little acupuncture needles in your legs and arms, and they test the speed of that, that's often to say, hey, the L5 nerve is irritated, not the L3 nerve. So it's a collection of using all these resources and investigations to say, yeah, if, if X, Y, and Z didn't work, then we'd think about surgery. But it's nothing that, you know, you just come in, you started having pain the other day and, and you come in and, and it's nothing like that. It, it is a team effort for many different specialties. And this was the firefighter that underwent the disc replacement. So this was just, uh, this is from last fall, but my kids, but um, this was just kind of a, a talk just to say, hey, there are different options, different resources, and different possible pathways for different types of pain. And so the most important thing that I hope you take away from this isn't actually the treatment, it's making sure you have an accurate diagnosis. Any questions, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. The great question. Um, and, and without knowing specifics and speaking in generalities, it sounds like what you're dealing with, if you all of a sudden have shooting sharp electrical pain, it sounds like a disc herniation. Typically, people with disc herniations will go to the emergency room or they'll call their family doc and they'll get put on a steroid pack, a six day steroid pack. Um, if you look at all the studies and literature, over 90% of disc herniations get better by themselves within 90 days. So sometimes you can get a massive relief just after that steroid pack, and sometimes you need a steroid injection. But typically, yeah, that, that would be managed by the family medicine doctor. But, um, and I'm only, I only step in for those 10% that didn't get better with injections with steroids and say, hey, we should consider maybe decompressing the nerve because you're obviously miserable. But if this has been going an ongoing or chronic thing, it's been going on for two weeks, four weeks. And part of it now, unfortunately, is dictated by insurance companies too. There are some insurances where you can't come see me unless you have a referral from your primary care. And that's a minority, but still there's various things that you kind of, and we have to battle against like that. But, but, but going to see a spine specialist, whether it's a surgeon or, or a pain clinic, for nagging is a great way to start because oftentimes you can start with a basic x-ray and that will tell you a lot. At, at a spine specialist, whether it's a spine surgeon or a pain clinic, but um, yeah, it's a great place to start. I see everyone who has pain for, you know, days to years. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that yeah. Yeah. Uh, or things like that. It, it, it does, but actually not for the reason that you think. And, and so for those at home, I'm, uh, we were asked like chondroitin sulfate or, or the glucosamines or any type of those enzymes that are naturally found in your cartilage, if you buy them over the counter and take them as supplements, um, the answer is yes, but for they help, but for a different reason. So the original thought was if you eat these um, products that are what make up your joints and your cartilage, that yes, that will help you. But the reality of it is your stomach breaks down most of it. And it actually is, so it doesn't, your body doesn't see it. Oh, my, we're eating cartilage, so let me just ship it to the knee because that's where it's needed. But it's actually been found that those supplements have an anti-inflammatory effect. So they work by the mechanisms of like different, but similar to ibuprofen or Tylenol. So it, it provides an anti-inflammatory response in your body, but not necessarily a, I ate a cartilage piece. So now it's going to go to my cartilage and make it feel better. It actually makes it feel better because it's an anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 
is. Yeah, exactly, digest it. But even when you put it in, in the joint directly, that works by also an anti-inflammatory method, but it's directly to the spot where you want it. So. Yeah, I think that's great. I think, it, I think in general, if something helps, do it. If something doesn't help, well, you've proven that it doesn't help. So it's kind of um, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Um, that's when you try something new or different, like an injection or Pilates or, or strengthening. And, um, because even, even massages or deep tissue massages can often be very helpful. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm 69. Uh, I've skied and golfed my whole life. Amazing. Don't stop. 60 years. Well, okay, I haven't done either one for a year. No. And the problem is... It's not that I miss it that much. I have four grandsons, and I'm not willing to give it up. And I just don't know where to start. Do you know? I I got a chiropractor. I you know, and that, that's helpful, but it doesn't cure anything. It might, you know, what 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 do I do? Just go in and be X-rayed? And yep. And get a proper exam or a different type of exam yeah. because you've obviously tried different avenues. And, and for most people, I, I don't meet 90% of people with back pain or because oftentimes it's short term. Oftentimes, whatever they've done in injection, whether they've done a supplement, an anti-inflammatory, it works. It feels better. But the, and my philosophy is this, is that if you're not able to live your life doing the things that you want to do, that's when you bump it up a notch. So that's when you would see maybe a spine specialist or your family medicine and start there and they can order an x-ray or, um, but, it, but I don't think there's anything wrong of, of going to see a spine specialist, especially if you're saying, I live for activity A and B yeah. and I'm unable to do it. Uh, and that's when you say, okay, something needs to change and it's not gonna be my activities. I mean, I, I, Right now, it's not that bad, but uh, I mean, uh, three weeks ago, it was debilitating. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I yeah, take enough acetaminophen or something, and you can make it temporarily go away, but yeah. I know it's not fixed. No, but I, I've, I've also uh, seen and heard from my patients that I've, you know, we've seen, we've evaluated non surgery, and you send them for an epidural injection. You get a steroid and numbing medicine in the area that you're having issues. And they're like, well, why didn't I do this sooner? And they're like upset. I should have done this way earlier. What are we, what? And I'm, I, would, I don't know what you're going to say. But, but my point is, is, is there are other options that, you know, aren't necessarily surgery that provide yeah. great relief to millions of people. And, and if, if going just to a therapist or a chiropractor isn't helpful, it's worth getting maybe bumping it up a notch, meaning getting an x-ray, getting an MRI. And, and really hammering down what the diagnosis is because more often than not, there's a treatment for it. Um, and it's just a matter of, is it worth chasing? Is the juice worth the squeeze? But again, if, if, if you're saying that um, I can no longer golf, ski, I can no longer fly fish, I can't, I can't take my dog for walks or hikes, I can't go to Mill Creek Canyon and do what I want to do or, or bird watch, and, and that's making then that's when you kind of say, hey, something needs to change. So I have a relative that has had some nerves cauterized or something and mm -hmm. suggesting that, and that's why I'm here. Yeah. Um, so earlier we talked about that nerve cauterization. It's this. It's radiofrequency ablation okay. where you're sticking the needles down and you're burning the nerves to the bone. And what that does is that disrupts the signal from that painful joint to your brain. Yeah. So, so that's it. We're again, if for the right diagnosis, it works smashingly for people. Okay. But again, that's the issue. As long as it's not, if you have instability associated with that, this isn't going to help that. But if you have really bad arthritis and it's just arthritis and no shooting nerve pain, this works great. Okay. It just seems pretty extreme. Yeah, I mean, everything, everything in medicine, personally, I think is very extreme. And, and 
only because if you if you were to take a step back and say you think of like a knee replacement or a, a hip replacement i mean you you talk to someone to socrates who just woke up and because he got his body cryo freeze and he woke up in 2023 and you're saying hey we we literally stab you and cut part of your bone out and we put metal in there he would have a heart attack so but there are but what i'm saying is now things are, you know, as technology and medicine advances in general, you get more receptive and open to that idea. But yeah, but I, everything in medicine is extreme. That You can take a, a tablet that is um, from this wildflower and it's brought down to its basic biology and they've turned it into a pill and that takes away my, my, my toe pain or helps with my diabetes. That's extreme. That sounds wild. But but uh, we're fortunate to live in an age with a lot of advancements. But it, but it ultimately all comes. I know I got a little off topic, but it comes down to um, kind of making sure you have the right diagnosis. I'm becoming more open-minded. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what about? <clears throat> excuse me. Um, when you wake up every single morning mm -hmm. with pain on your back, mm -hmm. on your low back. Mm -hmm. And that is every single morning. Yeah. Um, what I do, I don't usually take me pain medication. Mm -hmm. um, try to do some stretches, some movements that I think they help. And I do that, you know, every single day. Yeah. Um, but when I had to go to a place where I had to be sitting for a long time, you know, it's hard to, for me to get up and start walking. So what, what is uh, something that you can suggest? So it's, well, it's tough to say again, because it all comes down to diagnosis. So who knows if it's because of a pinched nerve or because of one of your bones may be compressed or have a compression fracture because of and I'm just being hypothetical because of osteoporosis that you didn't even know about, or it could be a muscle thing. It could be a muscle thing. Like, um, when you wake up because you just spent eight hours sleeping, you weren't warmed up for your activity of getting up and loosened up much like how professional athletes before a sporting event, they need to stretch out. They need to warm up before they play a game. No one goes from zero to 100 like that. And unfortunately, as we age and, and sometimes it can take a longer time to warm up, but it could be a muscle thing. It could be a bone thing. It could be a ligament thing. It, it's, it's tough to say, but there, there's multiple things that it could be. After I start moving, you know, walking in the house and little by little, it goes away. Yeah. And it, it could very well be a muscle thing where your muscles are very tight in the morning and it takes some stretching, but it would be hard for it to say without an x-ray or without just to make sure you're not, missing something bigger, but, but it very well could be something like that, or it's a muscle, your muscles need to warm up and some time to, um, to essentially move for lack of better words. Okay. And then we have quite a few questions online, so I can start to go through some of those just while I've got time, but anyone in person, if you have more questions, please feel free to hit your button and ask. Um, so the first question that we have is somebody asked if a herniated disc will happen slowly over time, or is it like an injury that occurs at once? The underlying principles of a disc herniation, uh, let me get to that slide. Long story short, it, it's a complicated thing and it can be both. It can happen acutely where someone is skiing and they bend over and they put pressure on a disc and it ruptures, That's, that'd be acute. But sometimes for whatever reason, it's genetics, it's, it's a work environment, like people who operate jackhammers or truck drivers, that slow vibrations, that can ruin the integrity of the shock absorber. So sometimes that can build up over years. And sometimes it has people, there are some people with poor genetics that say, my sister, my brother, my parents, they've had horrible back issues. And oftentimes that could be maybe because the proteins that are coating your discs can be weaker. And then you predispose them, which here in Utah, it's very easy to do by, you know, putting on a 20 pound backpack and going hiking in the mountains and saying, man, I have pain after. Sometimes, um, 
essentially it can be to a disc that has poor makeup, but then there's an uh, acute event that triggers it to kind of blow. And then over time, it can get worse and worse and worse as things collapse. So they can be both acute and they can be both traumatic. And there's not one specific reason because quite honestly, if there was one specific reason, um, it would already be treated. Perfect. Okay. And then um, let's see, you mentioned that Pilates helps strengthen muscles. What muscles does that help and how does that improve pain? So many times, especially now with various, uh, I don't know how I did that. Yeah. I'm looking for that photo of the Pilates. Many times, if we face it, and the reality is all of us are somewhat deconditioned. The type of workplace environment and how we get our food, we're no longer active for much of the day. I mean, we exercise for 20 minutes, and which is still quite a bit, and most people don't even exercise 20 minutes a day. But we only, we're, we're somewhat deconditioned, and, and especially with phones and computers, much of what we do is somewhat hunched over, bent, whether you're looking down. And what happens is, is our extensor core, so the muscles in the neck, the, the, the muscles that hold your shoulder blades and back together, and your low back, often can become really weak. So over time, you get a little slouched, and, and your posture may not be as good, and your muscles get weak. And what that does is that puts more pressure on the spinal column, which is in the middle of your body. So imagine kind of going back to the horses on the reins. If you have a weak pull on the reins, the horses are going to go forward more. So it puts more pressure on the discs and on the bones. So what Pilates does and other strengthening and the basis of physical therapy is it strengthens those muscles to help offload those discs. So it puts less pressure on those discs and it pulls everything back and unloads that pressure. So that's the idea behind of how strengthening like Pilates, which is a lot of planking, and a lot of extensor exercises can strengthen those reins to offload the pressure on those discs, on those nerves, and on those bones. Perfect. Okay. And then let's see. The next one is, um, can a bulging disc get bigger if it goes untreated? Uh, it definitely can. Most of the time, it actually does the opposite. It gets smaller. 90% of disc herniations resolve on their own, typically in 90 days, meaning they scar down with time, they get kind of sucked in and your body has a great defense. But there's 10% that it can either continue or also that disc can, for, better, for lack of better words, say, this disc, I suck and I'm going to continue to give you problems, meaning that whole shock absorber, it's not just part of it that's bad, it's the whole thing. And it's the gift that keeps on giving. So yes, it can, even after a microdiscectomy, there's a small percentage chance that it can re-herniate. And that's not related to surgery, but that's because that one specific disc, although rare, um, keeps on giving. Okay, and then I heard that long-term steroid injections can stop working or weaken parts of the body. Is there a typical timeline of when you would stop injections and move towards um, talking about surgery? Great question. So the first part, um, that typically, when you see systemic changes, that's if you're taking lots of oral steroid tablets or IV. When you have a steroid injection, it's only a, typically one milliliter of a steroid that's injected over and into the area of a specific nerve. So it's not a systemic high dose. It's actually a really low dose in a very specific area. So that being said, most of the time, multiple injections isn't going to do anything systemically because it's so specific in the area. It's not going in your whole body. Um, the second part of when would you consider, hey, I don't want to do injections anymore. I want to consider surgery. That depends on how effective those steroids were for you. Meaning if you have an injection and it works for a year or it works for two years, well, I wouldn't recommend surgery. I'd probably recommend another steroid injection because it's not surgery and it worked for a year. But if you have a steroid injection on a Tuesday and by Wednesday morning, it's all gone and you don't even feel any relief. That's when you talk about considering something else, because even if it's worked for a few days, sure, you could get another one, but what are you going to do? Get a hundred injections a year, every three days, get another injection. That's ludicrous, but, but that's kind of the, the pendulum. So it ultimately is, 
how long was it effective for? And that's when you say, hey, either I do want to continue doing the injection route, which is very reasonable, or it only helped for a day, if at all, that's when you would consider something surgical. Okay, and then we have one more from online, and that is, um, so when it comes to surgery, um, you showed kind of the different areas in which you can go, and they said, is there a diagnosis that would require more than one approach during surgery, like going in from the front and the side at the same time? Yeah, so it depends, and, and typically you see the multi-level, like a fusion, or if you have multiple levels of instability, or quite honestly, where it is, if you even have two levels, sometimes only one level you get to from the front and another level you get from the side. Sometimes you can get to all the levels from the back that you're targeting. Um, it all depends because even if you have a higher up, you were always worried about the ribs that can get in the way from the side. You worry about the kidneys and the lungs. So that can limit you, which means you can go from the back or from the front. And it all depends which level. So the lowest lumbar level is L5S1. Typically, that's treated from the front. L4-5 is a mixed bag because of, that's where the vessels are. So sometimes that's treated from the back. Sometimes it's from the side. Sometimes it's from the front. And the higher up you go, typically it's treated from the back. But the most, two, two most common levels that are people develop problems at are L4-5, which is the second from the bottom, and L5-S1, which is the bottom one. So typically that's treated from the front or from the side or from the back. But there are other circumstances like... Um, Sometimes if you've had previous abdominal surgery, something with, you know, a ruptured colon or you're not able to go from the front because quite frankly, it's too dangerous. So sometimes you have to go from the side or from the back, but it, it's very, um, every surgery is custom tailored to the patient. There's no doubt about that. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. That was all the online ones. Does in person, do you guys have any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you so well, much, Dr. Yeah. Sakura. Thanks um, for your time. Hopefully was, you were able to take away something from this. Yeah, that was great. And then for everyone that is here in person and online, you will get um, a link to the recording from tonight's seminar with Dr. Sakura emailed to you tomorrow. So just check your email and you will have that recording so that you can go back and review it if there's anything that you missed. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank Hopefully you. you took something from it.